Welcome to another episode of The Square. I'm super excited to be here with co-host extraordinaire Joel Effersey. Hello, everyone. And today we have another in our series of A Curious Conversation With, and today we have Crispin Reedy, uh, who is a voice user interface designer. Uh, thank you for being here, Crispin. Oh, you're very welcome. So tell me a little bit about what a voice user interface designer does. Sure. So a voice user interface is pretty much anything that you can talk to. So these have gotten a lot more popular these days with the Google Homes and the Alexas, also Siri and you know Samsung Bixby. But um, there's actually a lot of other ways that uh, you can use a voice user interface. Uh, like for example, industrial applications, it can be very powerful to be able to talk to something hands-free without actually having to, you know, touch it. To, you know, for example, note taking in medical applications. Um, a colleague of mine did one where farmers could be driving their tractor around in their field and uh, talk to the condition of the fields. Um, but actually also, um, it, 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 I don't want to restrict it to just voice because really we're talking about conversational user interfaces. Okay. So things like chatbots, um, you know, something that you can talk to. Uh, for example, uh, Bank of America's Erica, uh, you can talk to it or you can chat with it at the same time. And that's actually part of the Bank of America app. So, um, you know, because sometimes, sometimes you don't want the voice modality, right? Sometimes you want to be able to do something kind of silently, but still have that ease of a natural language interface. So, all right, so I got to ask, how did you get into this? I mean, of all the things, you're obviously very smart. How, uh, why this, why voice <laughs> user interface? Um, it just really intrigued me. And actually, I have been involved with voice user interfaces back in what they might call the OG days of voice user <laughs> interface, when you could call up those annoying things on the phone and, you know, hey, what's my bank balance? That's actually a very old school version of voice user mm -hmm. interface, but a lot of the underlying technologies and design principles are the same. So. I would imagine that to make this technology work, you have a lot of people involved, a lot of players, a lot of different disciplines go into that. What aspects mm -hmm. of this technology do you specifically work on and why do you find that part of it maybe more interesting than others? Yeah, so I'm actually involved in specifically how the language gets crafted. So we call them prompts, what the system says. Um, so, you know, there's a certain amount of linguistics in it, which I've always been really interested in. I actually, my background uh, was as an undergraduate was as an English degree, English lit. And um, so you find uh, voice user interface designers from a lot of different backgrounds like English. Um, I know a fellow who actually had a background in drama um, and script writing. Um, and so it, it's, it's just, it becomes something that people just sort of fall into it and they find out that they're really suited to it because they've got this odd background of really being interested in language and computers and people and writing and it's sort of it, it's it, although I will say these days more people have heard about it and will go out and seek it out because it is a, it's really interesting feel I mean you're crafting conversations sort of like we're doing right now a conversation only a little less long form <laughs> well okay so to that point I think Pretty much everybody uses Alexa or Siri, or at least understands how to use it. And that's there's been a, a big adoption of that part of the technology. Usually, with something that is, you know, generally only seen in science fiction, it's not that kind of an adoption rate. Have you been surprised by that? I mean, yes and no, because voice is our first interface. Um, there's a, a really interesting fellow um, named Clifford Nass who did a lot of the early research on this. And one of the things he found is that babies actually learn their language while they're still in the mother's womb. You come out um, with like different kinds of uh, phonemes that you mm. are tuned to. Uh, Russian babies laugh differently from French babies. Um, so there's some Something about, you know, the neuroplasticity of the human brain that is speech is really something that makes us integrally human. So the fact that this has gotten such a big adoption, uh, no, it's not surprising because it's something that I think we really want to do as humans is to speak and to connect. So a voice user interface technology gives a, can give a human 
sounding voice to a machine. So what you do sounds like this very interesting nexus between the organic, the cultural, and the highly artificial. You mentioned your background in mm -hmm. English and English literature. Uh, how does understanding language patterns, uh, even things like the history of language and communication, mm -hmm. how does that inform what you do? Um, it goes all the way from the very small to the very big, right? So on a very small level, there are little pieces of language that go into conversations, uh, for example, that are called discourse markers. And so those are things that help us as speakers find our way uh, into a conversation as we have them with other people. Uh, simple things like first or second or next, things like that. Um, and you know, those don't just grow, you know, in a, in a conversation with a computer. You have to create them and you have to think about um, how do you sprinkle in these little tiny bits of conversation into the overall context. So that's just a little thing, but it makes a big difference. But then all the way up to really thinking about the context of where the human in the conversation is having this conversation and what else is going on around them. So if you're in the privacy of your home and you're having a conversation with Alexa, you might have a lot uh, different uh, tolerance for talking about sensitive things like, you know, maybe you're calling your bank account, talking about your bank balances, things like that as opposed to if there are people in the room, as opposed to if you're somewhere like an airport where it's the general yeah. public, right? So I, it, it goes all the way from, you know, just the littlest nuances of language to the intermediate structure to the wider context. Is that, is that something that changes based on demographic or even maybe geography of where you are in the world? Oh, definitely. I mean, well, just your conversations are different in terms of like who you're trying to speak to. Um, you know, for example, Amazon's spent a lot of time talking about how you could craft these conversations specifically for children. Um, you know, so they've got an entirely different um, set of standards and practices around the kinds of things that you can talk to children about in their, you know, their, it's the kid safe Alexa zone is what it really is, you know, um, versus, um, I actually did a research study um, for uh, our, uh, our company, we were, we were got, getting kind of interested in how power users use these things. And so, you know, they're using them in completely different ways. They're adapting them. You know, some of them are even writing their own skills, which has gotten a lot easier, by the way. Amazon's made it very easy for even ordinary people to write their hmm. own you know, skills that you can use in your own home. But yeah, um, it, it people are using the technology very differently and um, the people who are making the conversations, creating the conversations, think about that when you're thinking about um, who you're writing for. Um, I mentioned earlier about the um, uh, application of somebody in a field, a farmer in a field driving a tractor. Um, he's using that application, that voice application, um, every day, multiple times, and so he's going to learn it. So you want to do things like give him shortcuts, um, give him you know power moves, um, and keep the conversation very terse, as opposed to if you're doing something that's much more for entertainment, um, then the people who are doing those types of skills are going to plant little Easter eggs in there for fun. They're going to make him a lot of music, a lot of different kinds of sound. They're really going to try and jazz him up and give him a lot of different personalities. So it's a big, big range of different things that people are doing with voice right now. Well, I know we both have kids, mm -hmm. so I am curious because we're talking about the different demographic. I'm also curious about different age groups because I uh, will often mm -hmm. hear my kids yelling <laughs> at Alexa to play a certain song or something. But what's crazy is to think about how they're picking up this school skill. You know, you were talking earlier about uh, babies in the womb and whatnot, picking up those, those mnemonic things. My kids are picking up the ability to have this voice user interface without even realizing it's something that didn't exist before mm -hmm. five, 10 years ago. Is there, is there mm -hmm. any kind of research in how they're gonna be earlier adopters how's this, as this technology moves forward? Oh yeah, I mean, so it, one of the things that people are finding as their children use these uh, Alexa um, skills or Google skills is that um, 
pe the children are bringing the expectation that they can talk to anything, mm -hmm. right? They can talk to, you know, they want to talk to the toaster, they want to talk to the <laughs> fridge. So it's really interesting because those kids are going to have their expectations mm -hmm. <laughs> disappointed a little bit, right? You can't talk to the toaster just yet. Well, may there might be a toaster. Oven, I don't know, make actually. me cookies. I can see that coming very quickly. <laughs> I'm, re I'm ready for that technology. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So you you mentioned using um, this technology for a, a fairly wide demographic. Um, obviously, each voice user interface, if it does have a human characteristic to that voice, it has certain qualities to it. It is male or female, or maybe it's androgynous. It has mm -hmm. or may not have a regional accent, a cadence of speech. In the mm -hmm. case of uh, asking some you know, cheeky questions of Siri, you get, <laughs> you get some sense of humor that was uh, programmed into it. How do you go about deciding the sonic characteristics of that voice interface? I teach a class at SMU, and um, we actually do about three hours of discussion just on this topic, wow. uh, because it's really, really interesting. Uh, and it takes a lot to unpack. I mean, first of all, you just mentioned the gender, right? So do you go with type, or do you go against type, because you're there's a lot of cultural construction, especially in the United States, around the operator being female, right? And so you can actually look at a lot of different academic research, and people are talking about how, okay, yeah, this is a little bit of a stereotype. So when you're talking to somebody who is going to, like a business, who's going to create one of these, do you play with it or do you play against it? And it really kind of depends on what your goal is, right? So um, I had a customer who um, was actually looking to uh, upgrade their, uh, so actually one of the very first choices that you make is are you gonna do completely recorded audio or are you going to do computer generated audio? So for example, if you listen to Alexa these days, uh, the, the, the voice, the main voice of Alexa is computer generated on the fly, but then you can also sprinkle in recorded audio, like for example, Jeopardy. You know, you hear the music and you hear the real sounds of the real voice. So that's actually all the way back at the beginning. That's the first choices you make. Are you going to use this computer generated, it's called text-to-speech audio. And are you going to use that, or are you going to use recorded audio, or are you going to use a mix, a mix of both? And so that's where you start to get technological considerations into account, is to, are you operating on Alexa? What do you have to offer there? Are you operating on Google? What do you have to offer there? Are you operating somewhere else? And what do you have to offer there, right? Um, but so one of the things to think about, for example, a male voice, um, a lower register is actually a little bit easier to hear, um, especially if you're like in a noisy environment, uh, maybe if you're on the phone. Um, so there could be really good accessibility reasons for you know going for a male talent and or a male text to speech voice and going in that direction. Um, but it really, what it really comes down to is engaging with uh, the customer who is going to the client who is going to put that voice out there and saying to them what do you want to convey to your user to your caller to your listener with that voice so you're right I mean we get into male female we get into the register high or low we get into how you write for this voice um, we get into maybe even a little bit about you know how is it hey is it you know I'm I'm Sally or you know super formal and I actually actually had um, a different client who was thinking about very different um, images in their mind of their personality and one was Oprah Winfrey and the other <laughs> one was Tina Fey <laughs> and I'm like wow that's a big difference between the two but it, it they give you very different things formality or warmth are a little older versus younger or peppy or a lot of fun. So which way are you going to brand? It really ultimately comes down to branding. So we've made reference many times throughout this conversation to Alexa and Siri. Those, in my mind, are the voice user interface technologies that most people are probably familiar with. I think we would be mm -hmm. remiss if we didn't bring up what I'll call the, the creepiness factor for those technologies mm -hmm. to work, uh, to some extent, they are always listening to you in your home, which is a, 
private, intimate environment. Um, mm -hmm. What techniques uh, do you or does the industry use to make that a little bit more palatable for people to essentially welcome into their homes as another a listening device uh, a listening device <laughs> yeah. that's a a permanent household guest that will not leave unless you yeah. unplug them it's really interesting to look at like the comics that people put out you know like the nsa will you please uh make me pancakes or something you know i mean there's just this wide variety of feelings about that and um, some people are very, um, especially, um, so that is also something that you see very differently in America versus Europe, for example. Um, so I, I do think that that particular concern for privacy is different in different places. Um, but for example- um, Well, I'm, I, gotta, I gotta ask, mm -hmm. what's the difference between Europe and America? Mm -hmm. The Europeans are even more concerned about privacy really? than Americans are. Uh, oh, yes. I have had Americans actually say things like, I'm willing to trade privacy for convenience. I actually have heard people tell me that in, in interviews. Wow. And it's like, wow, okay, versus, you know, uh, Europe, I think there's a lot more concern for, uh, you know, wanting to keep their own data, huh. you know, in their own house, in their behind their own firewall, as it were. But yeah, so, um, you know, there's a bunch of different ways. Um, some of it is just education. I mean, so these systems actually um, operate off of what they call a wake word. That's what Alexa or Hey Siri or uh, any one of those words. And so the wake word is actually uh, local to the device. So it, it, it's running right there. So you don't have any traffic going to Amazon or anything until uh, the device wakes up. And actually one of the developers that I interviewed for this research study that I had, done, I had done, he was so concerned about his privacy that he had actually put uh, what they call a network sniffer device onto his yeah. network to prove to his own satisfaction that in fact that was what he was doing. He was very proud of this. He was <laughs> like, yeah, I, it, I know what it's doing. <laughs> So, um, but it is still a little creepy and the wake word can get misunderstood and that is what leads to some of these very strange occurrences that do happen. I mean, with millions of devices out there, weird stuff is going to happen. Um, so I think it's really kind of um, a, you know, it, it, what happens over time, you know, these, these, um, these little things blow up and some people get some concerned and some people are like, yeah, I'm not going to deal with this. I'm not going to get one. But then, you know, life goes on and then, you know, they get one for Christmas from somebody and they're like, okay, let me try it out. You know, I mean, it, these things have been in the, in the ether long enough now that I think people are starting to get more comfortable about them. But it certainly is an ongoing conversation that we so have. With I don't people. know if you've yeah. had this happen, but it's been interesting because the way that our living room is set up, Alexa's probably only, I don't know, six feet or so from our TV. And what's been really interesting is a lot of times there's Alexa commercials that'll come on where people are saying, you know, Alexa, do this or do that. And maybe once every 60 times will it kind of respond. But it doesn't, it, it's funny because it's, it's almost like it can tell the difference between a recorded voice and a human voice and whether or not it's mm -hmm. local, number one. And then number two, it will still make sometimes mistakes when we're saying words, but we haven't said Alexa. Like we've just said something that sounds like Alexa. And it's interesting that there's that difference where it's almost like it can discern between a TV voice and a human voice, but it can't necessarily always pick up the word Alexa. Acoustics are really interesting and they can be a little bit counterintuitive because it's not just, um, you know, how the word sounds, but it's all the sonic energy around the sound as well. Um, but I guarantee you, um, if you did turn on the learning feature with Alexa, mm -hmm. um, she probably can tell the difference between your voice and the TV because um, it's going to sound different. Yeah. Um, I have my wake word set to computer. And when I watch Star Trek, I have to get up and turn it <laughs> off. <laughs> I, I think it is also, and speaking of human and computer, like mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's, I have a really good friend that um, is a, has done some um, voiceover work for the Spanish language of a very prominent, I probably can't say who it is, voice user interface. But I'm curious, like th some of, the, it's hard to tell the difference between human and computer generated. Mm -hmm. 
Oh yeah, it's getting much much harder. Um, it, it's going to in, part of the part of it is still though going to be the text, for example. So humans are so when you're talking about generation of natural language, mm -hmm. there's two things that are going on, right? There's the actual generation of the speech itself, and then there's like the automated generation of the conversation. Um, the speech and the phonemes is a little bit easier to deal with than trying to actually generate a conversation automatically that's still kind of my job so it, it people are working on that but it's a much more difficult problem than automatically generating the phonemes itself so turning a little bit to what we focus on at Corgan the the, <laughs> the, the built environment um, I, I know through Alexa and, and Siri you can use that to control uh, various um, internet of things you know connected devices, whether it's your Nest thermostat or your doorbell uh, or other systems like Mecha Shades or, your, or, uh, or, or what have you, uh, do you see a growing trend for voice interface to control buildings, particularly as elements of those buildings more and more are reliant on complex computer systems to manage? Oh yeah, that's the, besides fun stuff like listening to music, um, that is probably the biggest use case for voice. I uh, did an interview with a fellow who was into home automation before home automation wasn't cool. Uh, he, he was doing, I think it was called X25. I mean, he was doing home automation like 15 years ago and running cables everywhere and things like that. And as he modernized the system, at one point he switched everything over to Alexa and he said, yes, this is the user interface because you can say things like, Alexa set the dining room to 25% blue. He's got the hue light bulbs everywhere. Um, you know, he's got all, he's got all these different, um, you know, they call them like scenes, a sundown scene or, a, you know, wake up scene and, and that kind of thing. And, you know, before that, all of this stuff would have been done automatically. And this guy was so funny because this was like his hobby. And he actually, um, you know those um, Christmas light shows that you do with yeah. the dancing lights? And he had one of those for fun. This was like the, the fun thing to do is to set up the Christmas light show. And he actually showed me the, um, all of the cables, an entire closet full of cables. But he said, yeah, there's, there's no question in my mind that this voice interface is the way to interface with all of these home automation systems simply because everything else is so much more complicated. And he was so funny, he says, yeah, when, when, uh, when Alexa, when Amazon goes down, we can't do anything around here. <laughs> <laughs> so the idea of... The problem. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so the idea of using your voice to interact with, with a building, obviously as architects and designers, we find really interesting. Uh, there are some buildings, uh, certainly your home, but maybe your office or your school, uh, you may spend years of your life in. So you have a very, in some ways, intimate relationship with that building. Some of the buildings we work on here, like airports or hospitals, are very different. They often deal with uh, large numbers of people who have a very uh, transient relationship with the building. They may spend a, a few minutes or, a, or maybe a few hours in that building. Mm -hmm. Uh, in the hospital, maybe it's days, uh, on a very infrequent basis. So those buildings can become impersonal because of their size and just the, the transient nature of them. What are some ways that you see a voice user interface making that experience uh, more individualized and ultimately more humane or human-centric for users of those types of buildings? I think it would be really neat for an airline or an airport to do a little uh, digital assistant that would be, and it wouldn't necessarily have to be voice, right? It could be a chat assistant or both, um, but that could you know, be loaded on your phone. For people who maybe are infrequent flyers or something like that, they could really help you with things like wayfinding through the environment, um, give you hints, you know, um, integrate with other uh, back in so hey this security checkpoint is really backed up but why don't you go to this other one here 
that is, you know, definitely running a little faster. Mm -hmm. It could be like a little friend in your pocket because especially if you're not uh, a weekend, a, a weekday warrior, you know, one mm -hmm. of those, you know, regular flyers, if you don't fly very often, you know, those experiences can be very intimidating trying to find your way around. Um, so I would love to see something like that. I, I think it would be, it would go a long way towards really humanizing the experience of trying to figure out exactly what's going on in the environment. So do you think this technology, a uh, voice user interface, where will ultimately become commonplace in, in buildings? And, and if so, what does that what does that timeline look like to you? I, I think we all experience technology seems to be evolving at a exponential rate. Mm -hmm. Is this something that will mm -hmm. be here in two years, three years, or are we still maybe a, a decade away from, uh, from seeing this as, as commonplace? So the holy grail for this type of experience is like we had on Star Trek, right? You can go anywhere in this, the environment and talk to the computer and the computer will feed you and tell you what's going on and you know give you hints or whatever but um, it's a ubiquitous voice experience right part of the issue or I don't say issue but complication is that um, you know this is so in the world as we experience it there's a lot of there's an ecosystem right so um, when you're thinking about providing a voice experience um, you have to think about how that if you really want to get to that a uh, perfect holy grail of um, really supernatural feeling experience, you've got to have it everywhere. And so it, it becomes complicated in things like you mentioned airports, for example. So that's a very noisy environment. Um, and so it, it, I, I almost think that um, it, it might go the other direction where be, um, it's not so much dependent on having it everywhere, but that you've got your own little assistant mm -hmm. that will, like the airport assistant, but that will help you out with other things as well. And that could maybe even integrate with other assistants, right? Because um, it, it make it more personal because it's a little easier to do than trying to figure out that big connectivity. Like I think about, <laughs> I think about, um, I think about home theater stuff, right? Uh, my mom, I go over to my mom's house and she still has a little piece of paper um, to write down how to turn on the TV, <laughs> <laughs> right? And how to get to cable, right? And that's because we don't have the real true interoperability in those home theater systems, unless of course, if you buy a, um, a universal remote, but then you gotta learn to program it, right? So that's kind of the seesaw, right? Are we gonna try to get to the interoperability? And I, I think I, I see the smaller things as being a little bit easier to do, especially because, um, so I'll give you an example. There's an app out there called Wobot, W-O-E-B-O-T. And it's a mental health bot. And you can pull it up on your phone and you can check in with it in the natural language and it gives you hints and it was actually built by a team of psychologists and it gives you, uh, you know, approved mental health tips and techniques and it trains you every day. And I'm like, wow, as people get more and more comfortable with having these little pocket friends, kind of like, what was they, Tama Tagachi or yeah, whatever, yeah. right? <laughs> I can, I can really see, I kind of really feel like that's really the direction that this might go rather than going large, right? Going small, but then have something that helps you with everything around you. So I guess, it's so funny, I always, the Tamagotchi always died on me. But in that same vein, <laughs> when you think about, you know, the voice user interface giving a personality something. So when, when Joel and I were talking beforehand and we were talking about Hal and some of the famous computer personalities of sci-fi and the Star Trek computer, Jarvis, they, it was funny, I could think, I can imagine walking into Tony Stark's house and you know Jarvis becomes the persona of that design. Mm -hmm. Do you see where that could be something where you know, um, you know, maybe American Airlines has a bunch of different terminals in different cities, but there's a unified voice, or maybe there's mm -hmm. a voice per this reflective of the community or something, but where it actually gives the buildings personality? Oh yeah, very much so. Um, not uh, So I, I think a couple of thoughts. Um, 
I think one of the ways this could really be expressive is when you look at things like museums doing things like audio tours through their exhibits, right? They're already doing that today, right? They're already using those audio tours to express the personality of their exhibit, which I think is, you know, those, I love those things. They're amazing. Um, but, you know, yeah, an, a more interactive model, sure. I think it would be um, a really interesting um, and it humanizing, humanizing experience. Um, for all of them. And I think people do relate to these things. Um, I think the right word is they call it a parasocial relationship where it feels like a social relationship, um, but it's not really it's not really a social relationship because it's not a person. Right. Um, but you keep you mentioned Jarvis. If you're interested, um, actually, uh, Mark Zuckerberg, about three or, three or four years ago, he does personal projects every year. And um, one of the year, one year, one of his personal projects was to build himself a Jarvis. And so if you Google Mark Zuckerberg Jarvis, you'll find his blog entry about it, if it's still up, I assume it's still up. Um, but it's really interesting reading because he talks about all the technological, technological challenges that he went through uh, to build his Jarvis. But he said, yeah, uh, we found ourselves relating to it as if it was a human. So I think that's something people are pretty naturally going to do. Hmm. So the development of voice user interface technology, uh, again, I, I think a lot of people's first e exposure to that was through science fiction. It was something that was that was so far beyond kind of our everyday reality that it could only exist you know, 200 or 500 years into the future. Obviously, it is kind of raw computing power that enables this, but a certain level of artificial intelligence, depending on how you define that and, and, and what you define as intelligence. Yeah. Um, can you speak a little bit about the symbiotic relationship between those two technology streams in terms of what enables the other or where are there limitations in those two systems that would potentially hamper the evolution of, uh, of one or either of them? Yeah, so under the hood, uh, voice recognition is an artificial intelligence type of technology. Um, and if you're really interested in a, an awesome, mind-blowing video about uh, AI, um, uh, there's a fellow named Andrew N Ng, and uh, he has a YouTube video called Artificial Intelligence is the New Electricity. And it's really worth a uh, listening to you because he's explaining the technology for a lay audience and so you'll come away you'll come away with it going okay I feel like I understand this much better now um, but um, yeah it definitely voice recognition and natural language processing are a big part of the same family of algorithms and techniques that make um, image matching um, and artificial artificially driven cars. Um, all those types of algorithms are definitely in the same ballpark. And they do have, so, um, you know, they, and they are, they are heir to some of the same problems, right? So, um, you, you know, an algorithm is only as good as the data that you give it. Um, and that is true of image processing, speech processing, and, and any of these other ones. And I'll give you a specific example. Um, we had, uh, we were running some voice processing for a customer in Ireland, and they were actually um, testing with their Irish testers. And so the system was set up to automatically learn from itself. And so it learned the Irish accent from the Irish testers, even though we didn't really want that because the <laughs> main customers were in America. So, you know, you've always got to watch out for it. And, and the same thing is true of um, any type of image, by, you know, image libraries, image recognition, when they're scraped off the internet, they will have an inherent bias in them as well because of who's using the internet. Right. So, and what? And who's tagging those images? And how they're tagging them? Are they tagging them in English? Or are they tagging them in some other language? And do they ever get found at all? So, um, yeah, it's definitely a symbiotic, um, or it, 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 it's it's definitely they are of the same piece. It's the same kinds of issues and challenges that people are facing moving ahead. It's just a different, you know, basically in a different mode. 
one thing that we've seen a lot over the last five or going on six months now is with the COVID pandemic, it has been a catalyst for a lot of trends that were maybe already had started, but had not been fully realized and definitely wouldn't have been fully realized at the same rate that they are now. Um, and COVID mm-hmm. has kind of been this great catalyst for so many different technologies and, and different, different trends. Um, I'm curious, have you seen COVID be a catalyst in the voice user interface arena, especially with people being so much more hesitant to want to touch things exactly, now? Yeah. Definitely. The hands-free is a much bigger concern for people now and in medical applications as well. People are definitely turning around and taking another look at it. Um, But then also just in any time that you've got one person connecting to another and you could potentially have a voice user interface in there, um, it becomes much more interesting for people. Like all the things that people are doing with communication to the, um, you know, the restaurants and things like that, you know, there may be, you know, some voice recognition or other type of AI technology in the middle there that you don't even know about. We're asking you to do something difficult, which is predict the future. (laughs) Uh, Ultimately, where do you see this technology going? How do you think people are really using voice user technology, let's say in in 2030? How does it affect our lives on a on a day to day basis? Right. Um, I kind of feel like um, this kind of harkens back to the big and small thing that I was kind of talking about, you know. So the small thing being a, you know, your personal assistant um, that could be potentially an app, not, not necessarily a voice, but maybe a conversational interface. But then with the big things, you know, I do see it really coming more into the public sphere. And I do see it getting a more adopted in places like, for example, airports, hospitals, to make things easier for people to access that entire, you know, built environment and being more, comfor- being more comfortable in it. And I do think, I really see a lot of uh, potential for it in, um, unusual applications. I am really always amazed by, you know, if you think about it, anything you can think of that is better done hands-free is going to benefit from a conversational application. So in a lot of ways, I think it's going to worm its way into people's lives in things like the tractor application, but like you find it in gaming, people use it in gaming headsets. I really feel like it, it's, it's, it's both a deep and a broad technology, right? So it's going to go deep with things like apps, but then it's also going to go broad in things like just being added on to other things and enabling them to be much more easy to use. Like for example, you probably pull out your phone and will voice dictate yourself a, a, a memo to remember it or send an SMS with your voice. So I think it's gonna keep doing that. It's gonna keep finding places to spread out and make everything much more easy to use. Well, Crispin, thank you so much for joining us and kind of sharing all this knowledge with us. We'll definitely list um, some of the different links that she recommended. I'm really looking forward to downloading that app. Everybody can use a good (laughs) mental health app. We'll put that in the description (laughs) below. If you were joining us in the audio uh, podcast, make sure you check out the video podcast. Joel, thank you so much for co-hosting with me. Thank you, and thank you, Crispin. Thank you so much, and we'll see you next week on The Square.